Hi, my name is Leah, and I'm going to lead this discussion today about preoperative planning for total shoulder replacement. Our agenda today is to discuss what is joint replacement, what exactly are you having done when you have this procedure, uh, and what to expect before surgery, before you even come to the hospital, the day of surgery, and then after surgery, both here at the hospital and after discharge. When you find out that you need a shoulder replacement, a lot of people will go to the internet and they'll Google the term shoulder replacement. You'll find things like the words arthroplasty, resurfacing, many different words that all fall into the same category of shoulder replacement. What we're doing is we are resurfacing the uh, surfaces of your bones. So the end of your humerus bone, your arm bone, and the shoulder socket. One or both of those is damaged. The cartilage is lost from wear and tear or from trauma or things of the sort. So what we're going to do is we're going to put new surfaces on there to make it a nice, gliding, smooth, pain-free system. If you're getting a traditional total shoulder replacement, this is what it looks like. You're going to have a metal stem that goes down into your arm bone. You're going to have a ball that sits on the end of the stem. And you're going to have a plastic socket component. And this will all glide together nice and easy. However, if you are getting a shoulder replacement because you have a defunct rotator cuff, the rotator cuff has previously been repaired or it's just not in good condition and the integrity of it is bad, then your surgeon has suggested that you get a reverse total shoulder. The reverse is similar to the total shoulder, but as the name implies, the components are slightly reversed. You still have the stem that goes down into the arm bone, but the ball actually sits in the socket portion. And so you have the arm bone articulating with the ball that is in the socket. It's the same motion you will get after surgery, but the way this works is that it allows your deltoid muscle to do all the work that your rotator cuff cannot. So regardless of what you're getting, a total shoulder or a reverse total shoulder, the rest of these slides are going to apply to both sets of patients. The most important thing that you're going to do between now and surgery is to have your preoperative medical clearance. We have you do this with either your primary care doctor or a group that's affiliated with the hospital known as general medical consultants. These are internal medicine doctors who are going to do a preoperative physical. They're going to do blood draws, a urinary analysis, and they'll do things like an EKG, possibly a chest x-ray everything and anything they can think of to make sure that you are healthy and safe enough to undergo anesthesia and have this procedure done. If you don't get this done, you won't have surgery. So make sure that you have this scheduled and that you have it completed within a week or so before surgery. One of the most important things that's going to come from this appointment is a list of your medications. They're going to discharge you with quite a bit of paperwork, but we want you to look for the uh, paper that's uh, in particular outlines what medications that you take that you need to stop prior to surgery and which ones you need to continue. Because certain medications like aspirin, Plavix, uh, Coumadin, those things need to be stopped prior to surgery. But there are also herbal supplements that can cause your blood to thin a little bit. And so we need you to be very transparent about everything that you take over the counter and in terms of herbals and supplements so that we can get a really accurate count of what you need to take and what you need to stop. This slide here used to be very, very simple. It used to say don't eat or drink anything after midnight the night before surgery. That's changed recently, so we want to get into that more in depth. Now, you are not to eat anything within eight hours of your scheduled surgery. Not necessarily after, just after midnight, but within eight hours of your surgery. That includes candy, gum, mints, uh, and tobacco. Now, as far as drinks go, you can drink clear liquids up until two hours before you come to the hospital. The interesting thing here is what the powers that be consi consider to be clear liquids. Uh, if you look at the sub, uh, the sub points there, uh, water, Gatorade, Powerade, as well as black coffee and tea are considered clear liquids. Um, but you just can't put any cream or sugar in your coffee or tea. If you smoke, we strongly encourage you to quit prior to surgery for obvious reasons. It does increase breathing difficulties, but the biggest thing that I see as a provider is that it slows your recovery in terms of your wound healing. Uh, more patients come back to us with wound healing problems that are smokers than any other subpopulation. So strongly consider at least trying to cut back, if not uh, cessate smoking completely. 
It's, in, it's super important that you're uh, transparent about your alcohol use as well. Patients who never consume alcohol are going to be more affected, uh, more strongly affected by the use of pain medication than any other patient. If you drink regularly, you may need a slight bit more pain medication to give you the desired effect. Um, so we want you to be very, very transparent and honest about this so that we can really cater to you as an individual and make sure that you get what you need. The things you need to bring here on the day of surgery. You need to bring your insurance card, a photo ID, copy of your living will if you have one, a list of your medications, not the pill bottles themselves, and any paperwork you've been given. So anything that you've been given from your surgeon's office, from your preoperative testing, put those all in a folder, stick it in your bag, because you never know when you might want to reference that uh, while you're here. Comfortable shoes, we also want you to bring those. Something that's very sturdy that you can walk around in when you're getting ready to leave. We don't want flip-flops or anything that you might uh, pose as a tripping hazard. But so we're comfortable, sturdy shoes for discharge and comfortable clothes to wear home. Uh, when you're having shoulder surgery, this means very baggy clothes, things that aren't very binding and tight. Our occupational therapist will speak to that a little bit more later on in this discussion. Um, we want you to bring your CPAP if you use one at home because that is uh, dialed into your settings and we don't want to have to mess with that when you're here. So bring your own from home so it's already preset for you. Um, don't bring your home medications and we say bring only what you need. If you want to bring your phone because you want to talk to your loved ones or text them and you like to play games here and there when you're bored, that's absolutely fine. But we don't encourage you to bring your phone, your wedding ring, your favorite watch, your laptop, and a lot of things to keep track of while you're here. Minimize it as best you can. Your surgeon's office will call you to let you know what time you need to be here. That call usually doesn't happen until one to two business days before your surgery. So if your surgery is scheduled for a Monday, you might not get that call until Friday telling you what time to be here. So don't fret if it seems like it's coming down to the wire. You will get that call. You can brush your teeth on the morning of surgery. Take your pills that you've been directed to take with small sips of water. And you can wear dentures, glasses, anything that you need to make you feel whole and functional. We don't encourage the use of contact lenses, even though it does say that on the slide, because your eyes can get kind of dry around the time of surgery, and glasses are probably a better idea. Uh, don't wear jewelry, makeup, hair clips, or anything like that. When you check in, you're going to do that at the front desk of 323 East Town Street. Uh, that's usually the same building that you see your surgeon in when you go for an office visit. Uh, but we have valet parking out front. You're going to want to pull up, have the valet park your car, and then you're going to come in through the main double doors. You'll go to the half moon desk and you'll check in right there as the picture shows, and they're going to let you know where you need to go. You're going to go around the corner to an elevator and up to the second floor. That's where the waiting room is, and then your nurse is going to come out to get you and take you back to the uh, preoperative area. When you're there, you're going to have your own private bay. You're going to have a seat or two for your loved ones and a privacy curtain. Uh, your nurse will come introduce herself to you. They'll take your health history again. They're going to go over your medications and allergies again. And then you're going to sign any consents that still need to be signed for surgery. And they may do another blood draw that morning. This is also when you're going to meet your anesthesiologist and or your nurse anesthetist. This is a great time for you to talk to your anesthesiologist about any difficulties that you might have had previously with anesthesia. Nausea, vomiting, if you've been told that you're hard to wake up, things like that are where, what need to be addressed at this time. They're also going to talk to you here about what's called a regional block. So this regional block is an injection that goes into your shoulder area that helps numb your arm for surgery. We strongly advocate this because it really, really helps with post-operative pain control. Now, this injection is entirely optional. You do not have to get it, but the surgeons here really recommend it. They'll, they'll talk to you, the anesthesiologist will talk to you about the pros and cons to getting this done while you're here, and they will give you a little bit of relaxation medic medicine before you get the shot, if you're nervous about it, that kind of thing. So it'll be something that will be discussed and decided upon on the day of surgery. They'll also establish an IV in the preoperative area to give you some fluids, get you nice and hydrated before you go into surgery. When you do go back to the operating room, you will notice that it's cold. We
the operating room is very cold for two reasons. One, because it increases our sterility rate. Bacteria don't grow as readily when it's colder. So we like that uh, in terms of uh, keeping infection down. The second reason is because we wear a lot of stuff in the operating room, a lot of uh, materials that don't breathe very well. So it, keep, so it keeps us cooler because otherwise we would get very hot uh, doing the operation. Um, it is not unusual for there to be three, four, five, six people in the operating room. So don't look at that as a sign of chaos or a sign that things aren't going well. There's just a lot of different people that need to do their particular duties to make sure that this is a successful operation for you. Uh, and when you're in the operating room, you will be connected to some different equipment. You're going to have a blood pressure cuff on, a pulse oximeter on your finger to measure your oxygen level. You'll have leads put on your chest just to monitor your heart. And you'll probably have a little tube uh, that, that sits underneath your nose that delivers extra oxygen to you. So lots of little cords and tubes. Uh, and that can be disconcerting if you aren't expecting it. So that's why I'm bringing it up today to tell you that that's all a normal part of the process. The surgery itself is one to two hours, but you may be from your loved one for a couple more hours than that. Usually takes 45 minutes to an hour for you to go from the preoperative area back to the operating room and for them to position you and get you ready for the surgery. Then the surgery takes one to two hours. Then you go to the recovery room for an hour or so until you've got your bearings about you and everything is stable. So let your loved one know that even though the surgeon says the surgery only takes one to two hours, you're gonna be away from them for a bit more than that. You'll wake up with a sling on your shoulder and an ice pack. You'll also have that tube that I mentioned earlier, a nasal cannula delivering a little bit of extra oxygen. Um, and you may have a sore throat after surgery. Some patients complain about this because you do have a small tube that they put in your mouth and down your throat. But the great thing is that our tissues in our throat are very resilient, and that usually doesn't last very long, that throat irritation. But if you do experience it, let us know so that we can give you some lozenges or sprays to help with that. Whether or not you'll go home on the day of surgery depends on what you've discussed with your surgeon in the office ahead of time. Sometimes your surgeon will give you the option to go home on the day of surgery. Other times he'll tell you, I really want you to stay the night. That's something that is very ind individual and very dependent on your surgeon and your preoperative planning. However, the biggest determinant of whether or not you can go home is how you're doing right after surgery. You're gonna be in the recovery room for a good hour. They're going to be gauging your blood pressure, your breathing, and things of that sort. If you're doing great and you wanna go home, you should be allowed to. So after surgery, your surgeon will come out and discuss with your family how everything went in the operating room. Uh, you may or may not go home that day, like I said, depending on what the preoperative discussion uh, included. Uh, if you are staying overnight, your family will be able to come in and see you in the recovery room. If you're not staying the night, they're going to come see you in there as well so that they can get your belongings together and prepare you to go home. Every patient that has this surgery has pain. It's something you can't escape. Really, with any surgery, you're going to have pain. But we want you to know that we're going to do everything in our power to make you as comfortable as possible. We can't give you enough pain medication to completely eliminate your pain because that would likely mean that you would stop breathing or something along those lines, and we definitely don't want that. So, like I said earlier, we do advocate that regional block the anesthesia really helps with post-operative pain control. And we're also gonna look at each of you individually and make sure that we look at whether or not you've taken pain medication prior to coming in for the surgery, whether you're very naive to pain medication, and we will make determinations as to what you need based on those things. While you're here, it's important to know that there's gonna be a lot of people involved in your care. Your nurses are gonna come into your room multiple times a day and even during the night to take um, uh, your vital signs, to ask you about your pain control, to maybe do a blood draw. Um, your physician, your surgeon, and his resident or his uh, advanced practice person like myself, a PA or an NP, are going to make rounds on you. So they're going to come see you in the morning. Uh, and occupational therapy is going to see you as well on a daily basis while you're here. 
the nurses that you're going to work with work 12-hour shifts, 7A to 7P. Um, they're going to come see you and talk to the nurse that they're handing off to at your bedside, which I think is a very nice thing because it allows you to hear what your day nurse is relaying to your night nurse. It allows you to be an active participant in your own care. You can speak up if you hear something that you'd like to chime in on, which is very nice. We also have these whiteboards in everybody's rooms that are a good source of communication and information. They're going to have the names of your care team members on there, your do's and don'ts with physical therapy in that big box, and then in the small boxes down below, it's going to have when your last dose of pain medication was taken and when your next one is due, should you need it. There's a few complications that we want to make sure we avoid after surgery. The first one being a blood clot or a DVT, a deep venous thrombosis. So what we do to avoid a blood clot is we have you wear compression boots, as you see in this picture, that just very gently uh, contract and release and contract and release. And that helps stimulate blood flow in your legs. Um, sometimes your surgeon will give you a blood thinner like aspirin to help guard against blood clots while you're here. But again, that is surgeon dependent and it's based on your health history. Another complication we want to avoid is pneumonia. Um, when you've taken anesthesia in and you're taking pain medication, you don't tend to breathe as deeply as you would normally. Um, you're also not as mobile as you usually are. So we're going to do a lot of um, encouraging you to cough, deep breathe, uh, use this incentive spirometer. You'll be educated on how to use this. And we're really going to really going to tell you to get up and walk. It seems a little counterintuitive right after surgery, but getting up and walking is really the best medicine. It also helps avoid this complication. The more you can move, the less likely you are to get constipated. Pain medication and anesthesia, again, will cause this. And so we're going to tell you to increase your fluid intake, increase your fiber, uh, and we will prescribe while you're here a stool softener. We will also prescribe one upon discharge should you need it. You'll be started on a clear liquid diet right after surgery. Not everybody likes this, but we have to test the waters and make sure that your belly can tolerate it. Once it is tolerating, the clear liquids will progress you to a regular diet. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that there is a complication that involves your GI tract. And that means that when you are after surgery, you've had anesthesia, you've had pain medication, your gut kind of slows down and it's not moving like it normally would. It's less active. And there is an extreme of this called an ileus doesn't happen very often, but when it does, your belly is going to start to bloat and feel tense, and you're not going to feel very well at all. It's a very rare complication, but we still want to bring it up because we want you to be aware of the fact that it could happen, and we want you to notify your nurse or other care provider if you feel this uneasiness and, and that things aren't right with your belly after surgery. So next, Audrey is going to speak to you about occupational therapy and their role in your stay. Hi, I'm Audrey. I'm from Occupational Therapy. This section will just cover briefly what to expect, day of surgery, and the next day from a therapy standpoint. So after your nurse has done her initial assessment and you're on the floor, someone from Occupational Therapy, it might be myself, will come see you. We'll start talking about your brace, your precautions, start doing your exercises, and doing an assessment just to figure out what equipment you might need at home. We will start doing those exercises, like I said, we will do what we call passive range of motion exercises, which means the therapist, not you, will be moving your surgical arm. On that initial assessment, we'll be getting out of bed, at least to the edge, maybe walking to the bathroom. We'll be asking a series of questions so we know what your home setup is like and just start getting you used to your precautions, get used to the sling. We'll do sling management. We'll make some adjustments, make sure that you are comfortable in your sling. And we'll show you how to get dressed, talk about bathing, and everything that you need to do safely at home. So, like I mentioned, we are going to be doing two exercises here at the hospital, what we call passive range of motion. Again, you're not moving the therapist or your support person once you go home will be moving you. Um, which means that you'll be coming forward and back and out to the side. And again, your therapist will go over all of this. 
Your therapist will also show your support person. So it is gonna be important that at some point that we do coordinate that your support person is there definitely the next day before you go home so they feel comfortable how to do these exercises. These exercises are also all in the booklet so don't feel like you have to memorize anything but it's nice that we can show your support person you know how to support your arm, how to move you so you both feel comfortable. The most important part really about this whole presentation is from a therapy standpoint, are understanding your precautions. And again, I stress this, you will not be allowed to move that arm on your own for about six weeks. So someone else is gonna be, again, moving that shoulder, but there are some movements that we really don't want you to do by accident. So you're not allowed to do what we call funky chicken you're not going to be able to bring that elbow behind you so you can't elbow anybody and you can't do any side high fives so those motions could lead to dislocation so we want to make sure that you or your support person don't accidentally move your arm in those directions again no elbowing no side high fives no funky chicken no moving on your own and we also don't want you to put any weight through that arm so no trying to push pull pick up anything on that arm so no weight through that arm now we're going to talk about bathing um, if you have the availability to have a little shower seat i highly recommend it for safety just because you're wet and slippery and I don't want you to lose your balance and then do this just to catch your balance. So again, you're not allowed to move that arm. So I like patients to have somewhere where they can just rest their arm on their lap and then you can shower safely. No hot, hot showers because we don't want the heat to increase your swelling, which will just increase your pain. I would also like your support person to be with you the first few times you do shower just for safety. Depending on who your doctor is, you may be allowed to shower on post-op day three or not until after you follow up with him and he looks at your incision and he'll let you know, okay, now you can shower. But if you can have that shower seat, you can sit safely, that is the best option. When you are ready to start bathing and washing underneath your armpit, what you're gonna have to do is bring that arm forward, lean forward to create that space so you're not moving that arm on your own, wash underneath your armpit, and then with your good hand, bring your hand back and let it rest on your lap. And don't worry, we will go over all of this on day of surgery and the next day. So if this doesn't make sense, because it's kind of hard to see on the video. Next, let's talk about getting dressed. It is gonna be similar to the same technique that you used for bathing. You'll be sitting, you're gonna bring that arm forward, let it dangle. Bad side will always go on first, bring around the shirt and then put in the good side. To get undressed, it's the exact opposite. Your good side will come out first so that it can undress the bad side. And then when you sit on up, you'll grab yourself by the wrist, rest it on your chair or on your lap or on the bed, but no moving that arm on your own. We do recommend that when you are ready to go home that you bring something with a zipper or button downs. T-shirts require this movement over your head and again, you're not allowed to move that surgical arm on your own. So make sure that it does have zippers or buttons um, just to make it a little bit easier. We also recommend that it's about two sizes bigger than what you normally wear because you'll go home with that big bulky dressing and if you bring a normal shirt, it's just not gonna fit very well. So I sometimes tell patients, you know, go somewhere like Goodwill, just maybe get one or two really big shirts so you have something at home that just makes dressing a little bit easier. And again, we will practice getting dressed day of surgery or the next day um, once you are ready to go home. Sleeping. So this is really important. Um, one thing that I do 
tell patients, you will have to get out on your non-surgical side. So if you are having your left shoulder done, you'll have to roll out of bed or get out of bed on that right side. So make sure that you look at your environment and that that's going to be possible. That sometimes requires kind of, you know, switching sides with your significant other if it's per applicable or sleeping in a different direction. Now this does really throw people sometimes, so I really warn people, look at how your bedroom is set up and really think about, can you get out on your non-surgical side? Now, we do have patients who do sleep in a recliner, which is fine. All our docs do recommend that maybe for the first few days you sleep in the recliner. It's a lot easier to get some rest there. Um, but eventually, we do want to transition you back to your bed just to protect the rest of your joints. So whether you are sleeping in a recliner or a bed, there are some things we do want you to do to protect that shoulder. One of them is have a little pillow or a folded up towel about this thick, and it's going to go from your shoulder blade down to the elbow. That way, whether you're in the recliner or laying in the bed, that elbow is never touching the back of the recliner or the mattress. If you don't do it, it's not that you're going to hurt yourself, it's that it's going to pull a little bit here and it's just going to really hurt. So for pain control, letting you be able to rest a little bit better, we do want something to give you some support from the shoulder blade to the elbow. And that is one of the things that we will practice here positioning in the hospital bed showing you, okay, this is where I want the pillow, this is what it should feel like. So all of this we will go over again in detail. Next, let's talk about the sling. Depending on your surgery or your doctor, you might have a sling that is in front of you here and it's got a strap that goes around you to kind of keep your arm in place or a sling that puts you out to the side here with a little pillow in between you and your arm. One of the things that we definitely want the support person to be in the room for is the sling education. That will give the support person the opportunity to practice getting that sling on and off of you and make sure that you both feel comfortable with the whole sling process. So if you are in the sling where you're out to the side with the pillow, you will be wearing that sling at all times, day and night, for six weeks. If you are in the green sling that is right here in front of you, that one you will be sleeping in that sling at all times for the first six weeks. But with the green sling, the nice thing is, is that we can slowly taper you off of it during the day. So week one, you will wear the sling at all times. Week two, you'll wear it about 75% of the time during the day. Week three, 50% of the time. Week four, 25% of the time. So by the time you get to week five, you don't have to wear the sling. Although I do warn you, if you're gonna go out into the community, wear your sling. It just kind of gives people that notice that there's something wrong with your shoulder. So just so no one accidentally bumps into you or slaps you on that shoulder. So if you're going out into the community, wear your sling. But with both slings, you do have to sleep with the slings on for the first six weeks. And now I will bring Leah back for the next portion of her presentation. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you all. Okay, thanks, Audrey. So next we're gonna talk about what you can do at home prior to even coming in for surgery to help increase the likelihood that you're gonna have a successful recovery at home. One of the biggest things that we want you to do is look around your house. Make sure that there's nothing around that is a tripping hazard. Uh, throw rugs, extension cords, baskets, things like that that are around the floor area that could be something that you would trip over need to be moved out of the way. We also want you to move things that are on countertops down to arm's reach right there at chest level or at waist level so that you don't have to really stress yourself out trying to get something that's down low or up high. If you're like me, 
you like to have everything in a nice, neat, orderly fashion. And it's hard for some people to sit around at home and just let themselves recover. So for that reason, we want you to try to get a lot of things out of the way that might be tempting to be taken care of when you're sitting at home. Get your laundry, get your cleaning, things like that done before surgery so that you don't feel compelled to try to do them afterward. Uh, prepare meals ahead of time and freeze them so that they're really easily accessible. Take advantage of people, family, friends, church members that want to bring you food after surgery. This is the perfect time to let them do that. Patients often ask, am I going to be able to go home or am I going to need to go to a rehab area? We really want you to go home. Home is the best place to be after the surgery. Uh, you're aware of your surroundings. You're, you're most familiar with your own surroundings in your home. But we're going to take into consideration how you're doing after surgery. And we have to look at your insurance plan to see what works best for you. Um, usually patients are discharged the day after surgery to home. That's our goal. And we do recommend that you have a friend or family member with you around most of the time for the first week or so. Doesn't mean they have to be there 24 seven, but we want them readily available, checking in on you often. Occupational therapy is gonna work with you, as Audrey said, and they're gonna determine what you need at home. Sometimes patients need things like an elevated toilet seat, or they need um, a shower chair, things like that. They're gonna help determine what things you need at home based on what you currently have and what they deem necessary during their interview and their work time with you. Um, we will coordinate that with our case management department, which consists of nurses whose sole purpose is to work on getting you discharged with everything that you need. So case management, occupational therapy, and working with your insurance, we'll get all that stuff set up. You will need a ride home from the hospital. Um, there are some people who want to just take themselves home, but we don't we don't let you do that. Uh, so you're going to have to have a ride home from the hospital. Uh, insurance doesn't usually pay for that transportation. So think about how you're going to get home, who's going to take you home, that type of thing. It is normal to have a little bit of drainage from your incision after surgery. Kind of switching gears now, but I want to talk about what to expect in regard to your incision. Um, patients get a lot of bruising around their chest area, sometimes their flank area, belly, upper back. That's very normal, so don't be uh, alarmed or surprised if you do notice bruising like that. A little bit of drainage from your incision is normal. What we worry about is when it becomes profuse, when there's a lot of drainage, or if it's foul smelling, or if it's uh, greenish. Those types of things are what is worrisome, but a little bit of uh, a blood, a little bit of clear tinge drainage, that's not something to worry about. Your incision is going to be covered with the dressing when you go home. Different surgeons have different protocols on how they want their incision taken care of. Uh, one of our surgeons likes you to keep your dressing on until you come back to see him in the office. Another one lets you take it off in three days. You will have specific instructions on your discharge paperwork as to what you need to do with your incision. But regardless, once, the, once that dressing is off, you can take a shower. You can let water run over the incision. We just don't want you to submerge it under a bathtub uh, full of water or a pool or a hot tub. No standing water do we want you to submerge your shoulder under. Um, but you can shower, you can get it wet. We want you to pat it dry with a nice clean towel and then you can put a dressing on it only if you need to. If there is a little bit of drainage and you want to put a dressing or if you, if you want to, it to serve as a buffer between your incision and your clothing. Sometimes the friction from your clothing on the incision can make it a little bit uncomfortable. So patients sometimes want to throw a dressing on there just to serve as a buffer. No powders or creams on your incision. We don't want any neosporin or anything like that. You'll be able to put uh, vitamin E and cocoa butter on your incision, but we're gonna wait a few weeks before we do that, not in the immediate post-operative period. It is common for you to have a significant amount of swelling in your arm. The issue with shoulder surgery and swelling is that if you have swelling in your upper arm, in your lower arm, in your hand and wrist, the problem is that you can't go like this and let the swelling be pulled down by gravity because you're not allowed to do that, as Audrey said. So the, what you need to do to combat swelling in this situation is we want you to use the little squeezy ball or, as this picture shows, the little foam insert for your sling. We want you to squeeze that regularly so that you're going to stimulate circulation in your arm, and we want you to use ice. Ice is going to be your friend, especially for the first week or so after surgery. 
you're now going to belong to an exclusive uh, group of individuals after you have your shoulder replaced that requires antibiotics before any dental procedure whatsoever. Um, so it sounds like something that you may not be too excited about, but it's a very simple dosing of a very cheap antibiotic, and your surgeon will call that in to your pharmacy so that you can go pick it up prior to dental work. Um, what you may want to do is ask your surgeon to put a couple refills on that. That way, if you go to the dentist two or three times a year, you will already have that refill in place and can just take it an hour before you go to the dentist. Uh, after shoulder surgery, shoulder replacement surgery, we do not want you to drive until you get the okay from your surgeon. Some patients think, well, I'll just drive with my non-operative arm. If I have my right arm done, I'll just drive with my left. The concern there is that the unknown. If you have a little kid that runs out in front of you chasing a ball, your gut instinct is going to be to grab the wheel and turn it, and you're not going to be thinking about protecting your shoulder at that point. So it's more about the unknown. We don't want you to drive. We also don't want you to drive because most of the time you're taking pain medication in the first few weeks, and so that will um, make your ability to drive uh, a little bit altered. So, so we want you to hold off on that until you get the green light from your surgeon. We don't want you using any exercise equipment. Patients often ask me about going on a, walking on a treadmill, especially in the, as the winter months come in. Um, we're not a fan of that, only because your balance may be a bit off when you're in that sling, and so you're not gonna have your normal stride and balance that you would, would otherwise. So if you wanna walk outside or you wanna walk inside on a walking track at a, a local athletic facility, that's absolutely fine. Walking is great, uh, but we don't want you using any equipment um, or any weights, of course. Um, sexual activity is surgeon dependent, but the bottom line on that is that as long as you are taking care of your arm and you're not pushing, pulling, lifting with that arm, you're keeping it in the position that you're supposed to, if you want to engage in that type of activity and you're not breaking the rules, then that's, on, that's up to you. Um, this is our last slide, and so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this one for sure. Um, we want you to call your surgeon if you have any issues postoperatively with your incision or with pain control. Those things are super important to call your surgeon about. We don't want you going to the local emergency room or urgent care um, because they don't know what you had done. Uh, your surgeon is going to know exactly what you had done, is going to know you, and can give you advice accordingly. Um, so if you're having an issue with some swelling, pain, any discharge from your incision, uh, low-grade fever, uh, your wound starts to separate at all, or your pain is getting worse. Those types of things need to, they really warrant a phone call to your surgeon's office and request to be seen. Um, the one thing that would, in, would warrant going to the emergency room is if you have any signs or symptoms of a blood clot. Um, there are three primary signs, symptoms of a blood clot that we want you to be aware of. The first one is unrelenting calf pain. If you get pain in your calf that is kind of like a charley horse that will not go away no matter what you do, you're massaging it, you're elevating it, you've taken pain pills even, it doesn't go away, that could be a blood clot. Another sign would be a warm red area on your inner thigh that is painful to the touch. That could possibly be a blood clot. The third thing is shortness of breath or chest pain. That could be a blood clot that has migrated through your system and is now sitting in your lungs, and that would be a pulmonary embolism, which obviously is very bad. So those three things would warrant going to the emergency room. Anything with pain in the shoulder or incisional issues, definitely want you to call your surgeon and be seen as soon as possible. So that really sums it up. Um, you should have received a spiral-bound book from your office that's going to tell you a lot of what we covered today, really kind of goes over that in, in the same detail. And you're going to get specific discharge instructions from the hospital that we want you to look at very closely. Um, if you have any questions, any concerns, please call your surgeon's office. They have very uh, well-educated surgery schedulers, medical assistants, physician assistants like myself uh, that could help you out. So um, thank you for watching today. We hope it's been beneficial, and uh, we wish you the best of luck in your uh, surgery and the recovery period. Thank you.